Kia ora and welcome back. In this video we're going to change tack a little bit and we're going to look at a new kind of group called a permutation group. Now permutations are simply just a way of rearranging objects. So if you have five, object, five objects in, lined up in a row, a permutation of those objects would just be what you get if you pick them up and put them down in a different order. Now sets of these permutations um, that are closed under composition, that means if you do one then the other, um, form a group called a permutation group and we're going to study these for the next two or three videos. Okay, and we can put that slightly more technically as saying it's a, a permutation of a set is a function from the set to itself that is both one to one and onto. Okay, so it, it takes each of the elements in the set and it prescribes a new position for them. Now it may fix some elements, okay, a, a, the identity permutation for example will be one that doesn't change the order at all, but it has to be one to one and onto and that's uh, worth remembering as the actual definition. And so a permutation group is a set of per permutations that themselves form a group under function composition. Okay, so we will focus on finite sets, although you can define permutations for infinite sets too. So we will focus on finite sets. And usually we use the symbols uh, 1 to n. For our n things. Okay, so for example, we might write down a permutation like this. So if we have a permutation, the kind of the standard most straightforward way of writing down one is to write down your set of objects. So here I'm looking at a permutation of 1 to 4, and then I'm going to write down where each of those numbers gets mapped to by my permutation. So 1 gets mapped to 2, 2 gets mapped to 3, 3 get ma gets mapped to 1, and 4 gets mapped to 4. Okay, so this is quite a nice straightforward notation to work with and it just takes the, to look up how a permutation is applied to a number, look up the top row and then map it down to the bottom row. Okay, so that's a shorthand for saying my function is defined as alpha of 1 equals 2, alpha of 2 equals 3. Because remember if permutation is really just a 1 to 1 and onto function, this is just a nice notation for it and alpha of 4 equals 4. Notice that it didn't scramble all of the elements. Four got left where it is. That's perfectly fine. Um, and each, but we've written down and each, all four numbers appears appear in both rows of the table. That's what makes it one to one and onto. Okay, so if we're going to compose two together, we work right to left, just like we did when we were working with D four. So composition work right to left. And again, it's quite straightforward to do if we just work with. Um, work in this kind of notation. So sigma, let's, let's define two permutations. Sigma is, I'm going to work with five things this time. Here's one of them. Sigma is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and that gets mapped to 2, 4, 3, 5, 1. And gamma will take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and send them to 5, 4, 1, 2, 3. So the question is, what is gamma sigma? Okay, so here's how you do it. You write them down in the same order as prescribed. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 1, 2, 3, times sigma is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which gets sent to 2, 4, 3. 5, 1, and then we want our new product will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which go to whatever it goes to. All right, so how, how do we do it? Well, we start with 1, and we start on the right-hand one first, and then we follow it through. So 1, using sigma, gets mapped to 2. I then follow that 2 around to here, and 2 in turn gets mapped to 4, so overall, 1 gets mapped to 4. Let's do the same thing for 2. Now 2 gets mapped to 4. Follow that round. And then 4 gets mapped back to 2 again. So 2 gets mapped onto 2. Rinse and repeat. 3 goes to 3. And then that 3, in turn, goes to 1. And we continue on. 4 goes to 5, let's get a pen that actually works, 
and then 5 goes back to 3. So 4 overall goes to 3. And what's left? 5 should go to 5 according to this strategy. So 5 goes to 1, and 1 indeed does go back to 5 again. And that is the composed, uh, the composition of the two permutations. And we start on the right, follow each number through, see where it ends up, and we should get a new, com a new permutation coming out at the end. All right, so let's define our first permutation group now, and we'll look at a what's called the symmetric group, S3. Okay, it's a symmetric group. And of course, these S groups work for different numbers as well. So S3 is the set of all permutations of 1, 2, 3. Okay, so we're just basically having all of them, um, all possible ones. So we don't leave any permutation of three things out of this set. So it's the biggest group that we can possibly make of permutations of three elements. So let's just write down what all of the members are. Okay, so our identity, we'll call epsilon. That simply just takes 1, 2, 3 onto 1, 2, 3. Okay, not very exciting permutation, doesn't do anything, but in every group we must have an identity, and that one is our identity. This one is alpha. 1, 2, 3 gets mapped to 2, 3, 1. So this is like a cyclic shift, okay? Um, 1, 2, and 3 have been moved across to the left, and 1 is cycled back round to the other side. So you can imagine that's kind of, take 1, 2, 3, shift them across one space to the left, and then bring the 1 back around the other end. If we do that again, we get what we call alpha squared, because it is just alpha squared. Um, what You can check it yourself. 1, 2, 3. Shift it across to the left one space further, and we'll get 3, 1, 2. So you may think this looks quite a lot like a cyclic group, and in fact it is the same kind of thing so far, and we'll talk more about that later. But yes, it does look like we're cycling. But now there are other things other than cycling these elements around that we can do, um, and this is includes transposing elements. So our second set of three things are going to be the switches of two um, of the numbers. So two, three gets transposed to three, two, one gets left alone. Our second one is one, two, three, two, one, three. So now we're switching one and two. And you can check for yourself that that equals alpha times beta using the multiplication we defined just before. And finally, our last one is when we switch one and three around and leave two intact. And again, you can check for yourself that this is in fact alpha squared times beta. All right, now, what can we, so those, this in fact is all we can do. Think about that for a minute and hopefully you can figure out that we can't find any more. We've sort of exhausted our number of possibilities. So we'll note, one thing jumps out at us, alpha beta is 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 3. Beta alpha, if we were to calculate it, Okay, so we start on the right, so alpha 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, so 1 goes to 3, uh, 2 goes to 3, which goes back to 2, um, and then 3 goes to 1, which goes back to 1. So beta alpha is actually equal to alpha squared beta, which in particular is not equal to alpha beta. Okay, so beta alpha is not alpha beta, so S3 is not an abelian group. Remember, to be an abelian group, everything must commute with everything else. We've found an example of two elements, alpha and beta, that don't commute, so S3 is not an abelian group. All right, so we can generalize this um, to Sn. Okay, for n greater than, we only define this for n greater than or equal to 3. Um, this is the set of all permutations of 1 through to n. Okay, so the first thing we want to figure out is how many elements are in this set. So what is the order of Sn? 
Okay, well, let's just think about this for a second. Um, the element 1 has to get mapped to something. So there are n minus 1, well, in fact, n possible choices of elements that, uh, that 1 could be, get mapped to. So if alpha, how am I just write this down? There are n choices for alpha of 1. Okay, so if we're writing down the first column of our table, um, the element 1 can get mapped to any of the n things. Now once we've fixed that, for each of these, okay, so we've figured out what alpha of 1 is, and now we have n minus 1 things left over, and we can choose any one of them for alpha of 2. There are n minus 2, uh, sorry, n minus 1 choices for alpha of 2. So now we've chosen something for alpha of 1 and something for alpha of 2. For each of those choices, there are a further n minus 2 choices for alpha of 3. Etc. Until we get to the last position and we get one choice for alpha of n. So that means that the order of Sn is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times 2 times 1 is equal to n factorial. So there are n factorial possible permutations of n items. That makes sense for S3, which we just did. We've, we found there were 6. Indeed there are. 3 factorial is 6. Um, and also, Sn is not abelian. How can we easily demonstrate that? Well, we can just take, let's just assume we're greater than 3, because we've already done it for 3. If we just define permutations that fix 4 up to n in place, and then just let the first 3 permute, then we've basically put S3 in as a subgroup of Sn, in a sense, in that we're just kind of ignoring what's going on with 4 to n, because we're only going to consider the permutations that leave those in place. So what we've done is we've embedded S3 inside Sn here, and we know that that's not abelian, so Sn can't be either. So it's not abelian. We can we can embed S3 inside it. Okay, so now it's time to look at another example, I think. We're going to return to one that we've looked at before. This is the group of symmetries of a square. Now we already understand this group, we've already kind of studied it, but it turns out we can study this using permutations as well. So I'm just going to recap a little bit about our D4 conversation. So remember we're looking at symmetries of a square, we're looking at transformations of squares and seeing what happens. So remember what we did? Let's just do R90 again, remind ourselves how that works. So remember we had a square and we labelled, let's try that again, we labelled the corners A, B, C and D, like so, just going to because it's not 100% the order in which I did it earlier, but that, that'll do the trick. And then when we did R90, that rotated the thing around like this. Okay, so if we now were to number the corners here and leave those numbers fixed in place, We can see that when we rotate our square, one a goes from one to two. So we we can kind of think of that as a permutation, in that the number a is going from one to two. So we're going to write down one goes to two. So we'll call this thing row, and we'll have one going to two. If we now look at corner b, this is like corner a here. Corner b, b takes two to three. Okay, B is at 2 in the first picture and at 3 in the second. Similarly, C takes 3 to 4, and D uh, takes 4 to 1. This works for reflections as well. Let's do the horizontal reflection. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, This time, I'll write A, B, C, D down here. If we reflect horizontally, that's along this line here. 
Then A and B are going to reverse each other, and C and D are likewise going to swap places. So we can do the same thing as before, and we'll call this one phi. So now, looking at where A goes, A goes from 1 to 2. Looking at where B goes, B goes from 2 to 1 this time. C, that goes from 3 to 4. And D, that goes from 4 to 3. Okay, now as we've kind of discussed before, um, we can get all eight symmetries by doing rotations. First, that gives the four on the front, multiples of R90, or multiples of rho, if we want to use it in our permutation language. And we can get all the ones on the back by flipping it over and then rotating 90 degrees as many times as we want to. So these two elements, generate the whole group. Okay, because the rotations by themselves, row by itself, generates all of the four rotations. And then H, followed by any number of rows, sorry, five, followed by any number of rows, will do all of the reflections on the back. Generate the whole group. So in this sense, D4 is a subgroup of the symmetric group S4. Okay, and in fact, um, historically, in the development of algebra, the only groups that were actually considered initially in the 19th century were permutation groups. And the kind of concept of a group that we, we, we're using with ax axioms and the nice abstract definition came later. But it turns out that in fact any finite group can be generated like this as some kind of subgroup of the symmetric group. So in a sense, permutation groups are the most general possible groups because we can describe all of our other ones um, as permutation groups of some sort, which is quite an important idea that we'll discuss a little more later once we've had some more practice at working with these things. So I think that's enough just to get started on permutations. In the next video, we're going to start talking about an alternative notation for permutations called cycles. And these make working with some of the theory and just some of the practical calculations a little bit more straightforward. So until then... Catch you next time.